Okay. Welcome to Birchland Park, everybody. Thank you all for coming tonight. My name is Diana Gomes, and I am a school counselor here at Birchland, and I'm also the chairperson for the Youth Safety Committee. And on behalf of our committee, I want to thank you guys for coming out. I know that it's not the easiest night to come out the day before April vacation. So we really appreciate your support and being here for our efforts to raise awareness and educate parents in the community on substance use and how to keep our children substance free and, sa and safe. So we really appreciate it. I'd like to start first by just introducing some of the vendors that we have here this evening. I'm going to start right over here to the back of the cafeteria. From the Chicopee Fire Department, we have Ben Turnberg. He is also an active member in the Scoop Coalition that is also right next door. And we have Richard here, Pedraza, representing Scoop, which is from the Springfield Department of Health and Human Services. Right next to Richard is Annie Parkinson from MORE, the Massachusetts Organization of Addiction Recovery, and she was also a speaker here last year at our last event. And next door we have Karen Robitaille from the Board of Health, who will also be having some information and flyers to hand out to you. And next door we have Barbara Sibilia from the Western Mass Parent Support Group. And last but not least, we have um, two people here from Honest Beginnings. We have Susan Daly, and we also have from SOAR, which is speaking out about addiction recovery. Did you like that? Yeah. Jill Panto. So I'd like to just give them a round of applause for joining us here this evening. Thank you. I'm hoping that during, um, after, or during that you'll have a chance to go over to the tables they're doing amazing work, and they are support and resources to our community, and they have a lot to offer, so please feel free. And also, I'd like to acknowledge the Youth Safety Committee. They volunteer their time to put on events like this tonight, and we have their banner right over there, as well as pamphlets, flyers, brochures, resources that I'm hoping that you'll also visit before you leave. Um, if anyone here has taken advantage of our child care, it's right next door in the community room, and they're going to be taking children over to our group room, which is right through the courtyard. So if you have to leave early for any reason or if you need to go um, grab your child beforehand, you can go right through the courtyard, take a right, and it's in the group room. And if you need to use bathrooms, there are bathrooms to the left of us and also bathrooms to the right. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you um, Dr. Ruth Poteet. Dr. Ruth Poteet is a Greenfield physician. She is a family medicine physician, and she's also the medical director of the Franklin County House of Corrections, as well as the member of the Franklin County and North Quabbin Opioid Task Force, as well as the school physician for the Pioneer Valley Regional School District, and we are very honored to have her here this evening. She is considered an expert and a leader in the statewide efforts to reform the way that heroin addiction is treatment. And she was also the recipient of the 2015 Community Clinician of the Year Award. So without further ado, I'd like to thank and help me welcome Dr. Ruth Poteet. Thanks, everyone. It's so nice to be here. These are all my friends over here. I literally have hung out with these people for the last several years, and they just represent really important organizations. It's, a, it's kind of a nice night. I guess we should all be raking and gardening and, and doing other work at home, so it's actually really nice that you're here with me, especially on, um, before a long weekend and uh, a vacation week. So what I'm really excited about is I have students in the room. Can you put your hands up if you're a student here? Yeah, and I just want to say, awesome. I'm glad that you're here, and guess what? Oh, in the back there, too. Um, this is not going to go over your head. Your kids are really smart, and this talk is totally appropriate for your kids' level. I usually actually give it to a bunch of adults, but you guys got this. And I'm going to do questions anytime in the middle, but I'm also happy to take questions um, at the end. So people think I'm going to stand here and talk about heroin all night. Amazingly, I actually don't spend much time talking about it. We're going to get there, but really what I do is I talk about brain development and about what it takes and what happens to us to... Um, make us vulnerable to developing addiction. So we're going to talk about the human brain. We're, is that in focus? What do you guys think? 
pretty much. It is, okay. I'm getting old and my eyes are out of focus. So um, we're going to talk about the reward circuit of the brain. This is the part of the brain that has three main areas, the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, and the prefrontal cortex. This is the, one of the most ancient elemental part of the brains. It's the survival part of the brain. It tells you to eat, drink and find a mate to send your genetic material forward. Your entire point of being on this planet is to survive long enough that you can create other generations. And it is this part of the brain that makes that happen. And the problem is addiction impacts this part of the brain. It doesn't impact your ability to see or hear or smell. It impacts the part of your brain that has to do with should I live or die today. That's why addiction is so hard to treat and why you want to avoid it if you can help it. So we think of it as the eat, drink, have sex, but also use drugs part of the brain. We're going to talk about a neurotransmitter or a chemical in the brain called dopamine. I'm not going to talk about serotonin. That helps with mood when you have low serotonin. You may have some anxiety and depression. But we're going to talk about dopamine, which is a little chemical that races in this area, this reward circuit of the brain. And it gives you the following things. It gives you this really high sense of reward and satisfaction. And holy smokes, that was great. I need to repeat that behavior. That's what dopamine does in the brain. It says, that was good what you just did, do it again because it's going to help you survive. Um, it has with it associated fine motor tendencies, which is why when you quit smoking, right, you really have a hard time because what you really miss is in addition to the nicotine, you miss opening the cellophane off the package, tapping it down, removing the cigarette, lighting the lighter. Those are all have to do with the finger brain memory. This part of the brain has strong associations. So when you're helping people in treatment, you want to start to do stuff that has to do with the fingers. We should have pottery studios in in beading and in little old ladies going into treatment centers and jails teaching people to knit and crochet and do things with your fingers because it helps break down that memory circuit in the brain. There are two behaviors associated with dopamine. One is called compulsivity or compulsiveness. I can't help myself, I am thinking about it. Um, and perseveration, right? It's the first thing you think of in the morning when you wake up. It's the last thing you think of before you go to bed. And if you can imagine, your ancestors were very good at those two behaviors. They were compulsive and they perseverated. And it's why we get to exist in this room, is because your great, 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 greats had great behaviors that allowed them to survive. This entire first row, they didn't have those two behaviors that allowed them to survive. That's why they're not there. So when you take those two behaviors, though, compulsivity and perseveration, and you apply them to addiction, it's not so helpful. It's actually kind of a pain in the neck, quite honestly. And for those of us in medicine, who's in medicine in the room? Clinicians, nurses, right? So in the ER, people are showing up. You've seen them eight times in the last three weeks. And you're like, seriously, dude, you need to stop drinking. Like, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and just stop drinking. But take a breath and remind yourself of those two behaviors, perseveration, compulsivity, and the part of their brain that is broken is the part that says, I need to live or die. Right? It is a very hard disease to treat, which is why, for my younger people in the room, it's all about prevention, to be honest. So I make an argument here today that all of us have a baseline dopamine of about 100, 100 units. Now, there's no way to measure that. You can't call your family doctor tomorrow and say, I need my serum dopamine checked. They'll think you're crazy, and they'll, they'll think I'm going to be crazy. So, but we're going to stick with the 100 units of dopamine. Now, some of us are happy, happy people. We're glass half full, silver lining, I can find a solution to every problem people. And maybe our baseline dopamine sitting at 105 each day. A lot of us look more like this, though. Our baseline dopamine's more like 85 or 90. And, and you guys know these people. They're in your family. They come to the doctor a lot. I saw a lot of this today in my office practice because these are people who just have a hard time making change, a hard time getting better. No matter what suggestion I come up with, they're going to they're gonna shoot me down. That's how it feels, at least in the office setting with me. So these people's dopamine at a baseline is sitting at an 85. So what happens is if we're all sitting at about 100 and you find that perfect food, and, and not long ago, I mean, these days we have so much access to food. You know, there are 
tens of thousands of calories at every gas station, right? Um, hundreds of thousands of calories. But back in the old days, when you found that perfect food to keep your family alive, you were able to shoot a deer, and you knew that that deer would be able to keep your family alive for 10 more days, you got a spike in your dopamine. You got a spike that went to 150, because your brain said, that's good. It's a good thing you saw that deer. This is a good piece of the woods. Nice bow and arrow. Get that arrow back. All's good. Let's do this behavior again. And then their dopamine returned to normal. When you have sex, it's consensual sex your dopamine spikes to 200, because that is behavior that is associated with survival and having future generations survive. So your dopamine would spike to 200, and then it goes back to normal. When you use a drug like cocaine, your dopamine spikes to about 350. And when you use a strong opiate, a prescription opiate, or heroin, um, your dopamine will spike between 500 and 900. And when you use a drug like crystal methamphetamine, your dopamine will go between 12 and 1300. So those are high levels, right? Those are crazy high levels. And what's extraordinary to me is that more of us actually don't struggle with addiction because it seems like, wow, that, I told you, it makes you feel real good. So why aren't more people doing it, right? So this is what happens in the brain. So very quickly, I'm gonna talk two fast drugs and remind you how the equation works. Dopamine works in the brain by how much you produce, how many receptors are on the other side, re side uh, receiving the information, and how many little vacuums there are sucking the dopamine out. There's three things that get impacted in the brain. Now, sitting here with me, you can't change your equation, but there are behaviors that you do that make you feel happy. What are behaviors anybody in this room does that gives you joy or pleasure? Yeah, exercise. Exercise spikes your dopamine, absolutely. What else? Say that again doing the right thing, doing something that you know benefited another human being, giving back, feeling like you're taking care of someone, taking care of a friend, taking care of a pet. That's, that builds your dopamine in your brain. Those are very positive things. Those are great answers. So sitting here today, coming here today, maybe your dopamine will be high because you did a good thing because you showed up to this event today. The way cocaine works is it turns off the vacuums. So when you turn off the vacuum and there's nothing sucking dopamine out of the synaptic cleft, that's how you got yourself to a 350. It's the most straightforward mechanism. It has one way of working. The way the opiates work is, more, is slightly more difficult because it goes through a mu opiate receptor and it has a negative feedback loop through the GABA receptor, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, it makes more dopamine. It creates more. So that's how those two fast pathways are. But we could walk through, sometimes with great difficulty, every addictive substance and every addictive behavior, and it ends up here somewhere. Someone once asked at the end of the talk, explain to me the video game pathway. And I said, I have no clue. Do I think that video screen time stuff is addictive? Mm-hmm. Right? For parents out there, do you sometimes have a hard time getting your kids off their screens? Yeah, I'm seeing it right here in the room, right? So is it an addictive thing? Sure, and at the end of the day, it ends up impacting dopamine, but the pathways are complicated how you get there. So the problem is when the brain is seeing dopamine levels through the 200,000 years that human beings have existed in this form on this planet of 150 or 200, that's normal, right? That's a normal thing. But when the brain starts to see dopamine levels of 300 or 500 or 1,000, the brain says something's wrong. Nothing in nature should give me a dopamine level that high. I'm going to turn down the volume. I'm going to downregulate. I'm going to stop making dopamine. I'm going to erase 80% of my receptors, and I'm going to turn on every vacuum in sight to suck the dopamine, this thing that gives you joy and pleasure and helps you to survive. It sucks it out of the brain. So every day, people who are struggling with an addiction, particularly early on in recovery, they wake up, their baseline dopamine's not 100, right? Their baseline dopamine when they roll out of bed every day is about a 40. It is hard to function. It is hard to have a shower. It is hard to bowl a bowl or pour a bowl of cereal for your kids or feed your dog or be nice to your colleagues at work. You're actually a bear of a human being for weeks and months and sometimes years on end while your dopamine is getting restored. So the way that addiction works is it breaks this reward circuit of the brain by disrupting your survival neurochemical in your brain. It is incredibly disruptive. So um, 
I want to talk about what happened at Bay State today. And I'm not throwing Bay State under the bus. I'm the chair of the Department of, Med of Medicine at Bay State Franklin Medical Center, which is my little Bay State hospital in Greenfield. So they're a hospital I work for. But I, every place I go, I get to throw the local hospital under the bus. So last night, I threw Lawrence Memorial under the bus. Tonight, it happens to be Bay State Medical Center. And I also know for a fact this happened in the ER today, because it happens everywhere. And that is that this man here on the top right of your screen is a 68-year-old guy with crushing substernal chest pain. And his wife calls 911 because he looks really gray in her living room. And 911 comes, we have both fire and EMS, probably you know, East Long Meadow police arrive too. They look at this guy clutching his chest and think, wow, he looks really bad. So they give him a sublingual nitroglycerin and a baby aspirin and a beta blocker and they put in a big IV and they throw in some morphine and they run an EKG that's measuring how his heart looks. It gets transmitted from the living room to the ER because that's how technology works. And the ER looks at that and says, holy smokes, this guy's really sick. Get him here fast. He comes in through the emergency room. They have the operating room already prepped based on this EKG. He gets quintuple bypass surgery of his heart that day. He's brought to the cardiac care unit. He's kept there for four or five days. Then he's brought to the med surge floor for another week. He gets a social work consult because he's going to be depressed because a lot of men with heart attacks get depressed. He has follow-up with cardiac um, rehab. He gets to see a new cardiologist, his primary care doctor. A lot of things happen to him. How much money did that cost? A lot. Definitely six figures. Somebody said six figures. About a quarter million dollars. In Boston, definitely a quarter million. We're in Springfield area, so maybe it's 200,000. It's a chunk of change, though. There's a lot of money there. OK. His next door neighbor is that young 24-year-old woman on the ground. Her mom knocks on the bathroom door. She doesn't respond. Her mom knows her daughter has an opiate use disorder. And so when her daughter is not responding behind a locked bathroom door, her mom kicks that door in, calls 911 when she finds that her daughter is lying blue on the ground, administers the reversal agent naloxone, also called Narcan. Her daughter does not wake up. 911 comes, so does police, so does EMS, so does fire department. They all have naloxone on them. Takes them four doses of naloxone to have her wake up. She is brought, not so happily, to the ER at Bay State. And what is offered to her? What do you guys think? So my smart row here thinks she's offered help. She may be offered some help. And, um, the question is, how did that help? What form did that help come in? They could have given her a brochure with some telephone numbers and said, you need to call these numbers every half hour for the next 36 hours till you can find a place that will take you. But she's sick. She's actively sick, right? She's vomiting. She has diarrhea. Her body hurts. She's miserable. Because getting yanked instantly into withdrawal is awful, right? Yeah. Uh, well, that's an interesting and complicated question. Sometimes, actually, when people have an opiate overdose, they do give them some of the pills that they accidentally overdosed on, which we actually think is not helpful. But sometimes that is something that happens. So let's go back to our 68-year-old guy, because I want to tell you a little more about him. He's a two-pack-a-day smoker. He drinks between 6 and 12 beers a day. He does not exercise. He has not seen me, his primary care doctor, in over four years, although the last time I saw him, I said, dude, you got some uncontrolled high blood pressure. You need to take these two medicines. He never filled them at the pharmacy and never came back to see me. He goes to McDonald's three times a week, and he definitely is not addicted to exercise. But what do we know about this guy, right? This guy is struggling with some addiction, right? He's addicted to nicotine. He seems to be struggling with an alcohol use disorder, probably addicted to sugar, definitely to fat, right? Um, and I would argue at the age of 68, oh, I didn't tell you this part too, both of his parents had heart attacks in their late 50s, so he had bad genetics going into this as well. This was a guy who created his disease, right? He did. 68-year-old men who have really healthy lifestyle in general, in general, don't get heart attacks, right? You have a healthy lifestyle, you're doing really well, you don't smoke, you don't drink too much, your genetics are pretty good, you, you keep yourself fit, and you're, you're gonna do pretty well. You're gonna get to live a really long time. In general, this is true. So did anybody wag their finger at him when they walked into his living room and said, you know what, I'm actually not gonna provide much care for you today? Because it feels to me like you may have created this problem. Right? Did anybody do that to him? Anybody deny him any care? Anybody, nobody even asked the guy any questions. He's having a heart attack. He needs emergency care without any questions asked. 
Yet when it came to that 24-year-old woman, we judged her, we blamed her, we offered her very little services. We certainly didn't spend much money on her, although Narcan and our EMS services, who are superb, that costs a lot of money, I recognize that. And my attitude about this is you either start treating everybody the same across the board, and we start shaming and blaming everybody, which would be my entire day, because all day long I take care of chronic diseases with people who don't make the best choices, right? But I don't fire them for their hemoglobin A1Cs and their uncontrolled diabetes, right? Can you imagine if I fired all my patients who were not heeding my advice? I would have no patients left. Right? Because there's only so many changes most of us can make. And who in this room is perfect? Who's a vegan who's running the Boston Marathon on Monday? Do I have that person? Maybe I do in this room, and I don't know. Okay, I got these guys right here. These kids are making the perfect decisions. But my point is that, you know, unless we're going to treat everybody exactly the same and, and treat everybody as badly as we treat that young woman, let's take a big breath and acknowledge that addiction is a disease that impacts this really critical organ called your brain. And let's offer people the best evidence, medicine, and support we can, right? Instead of doing what we do, which is judging people with addiction, that they're weak-willed people with a bad upbringing who got themselves into this hot mess all on their own and denying them care, which is what happens throughout our country. That's my attitude on this, and it's the reason I do this work, is I find this outrageous. Okay, let's go back to dopamine. So just so you know, I didn't make up the dopamine story. So what you see here in that middle column, vertical column going down, the middle one is a healthy brain. And what you see, there's a lot of orange light up. That's dopamine in the brain. All those are, are people's brains that are not addicted. When you go to that right column, those are people struggling with addiction. And that top brain is somebody who has a cocaine addiction. The next one down is um, somebody with a methamphetamine addiction. Third one down is alcohol. What I want you to note about alcohol, there's still a little dopamine there. There's a little orange that still lights up with alcohol. And the final one down is somebody struggling with an opiate use disorder. So alcohol, the wheels come off the alcohol bus fairly late in the game. It's why so many of us are functional alcoholics, right? Before you've lost your job and gotten your second OUI and your husband's walked out on you, people are sort of barely holding themselves together with alcohol use disorder. There are three things that are going to predispose you to having an addiction, and we're going to go through them one by one. The first one is having genetic history or family history. The second one is early exposure while the brain is developing. And the third one is a history of trauma growing up in a household. There's a fourth one that is not a precursor, a precursor to addiction, but that's poor mental health. And poor mental health is a subcomponent of those other things. But just because you had depression or anxiety as a kid does not mean you'll develop an addiction. But if you're a really anxious 14-year-old who figures out, wow, I'm not anxious if I drink, right? And I'm better if I drink, and it help, helps my anxiety, you're somebody who actually exposes your brain while it's developing to an addictive substance and that is what predisposes you to addiction. So let's talk about the genetics. If you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of developing addiction yourself. That is a huge number. It is very hard to find any disease with that kind of genetic risk. ADD has that level of genetics, but very few other diseases look like this. And who needs to know their genetic risk for addiction? Our kids. Our kids need to understand. You don't need to go into the gory details. They don't need to know who and why and what and all the hot messes that we're getting into. But they need to understand the way I sat down with my three kids and said, you three are at high risk for developing addiction based on our genetic history. Because your kids don't get to select their genetics. They get what they get. And that's the hard thing about that piece of news but they get to influence the next thing. In fact, they're the only ones that have 100% control over the next thing. And that next thing is so powerful that it erases the genetics. It makes the genetics go away. And that is when they expose their brain to an addictive substance. Because the second thing that we can say is early exposure while the brain is developing is what creates addiction. Between the ages of 12 and 24, and we're going to dive in exactly on this in a couple minutes, very important things are happening to the brains. Now, is everybody over 12 in the room? I think so. Okay. How old are you guys? You are not. Holy smokes. They're like 90th percentile 11-year-olds. Holy smokes. Okay. So while the brain is developing, 
um, during this time of ages 12 to 24, that is when addiction starts. It means not that 11-year-olds are using cocaine, because that's an extremely unusual thing, but it means that they've started with something, whether it's alcohol, nicotine, or marijuana. Those are the three most common first start drugs. In the average age, when you talk to somebody who has an addiction and you ask the question, how old were you when you first started? Most people will say, I was 12, 13, or 14. Those are the normal first ages. When I've done the talk um, at our local recovery center associated with the Hamden House of Corrections, when you ask a group of people who've been incarcerated, right, who are in jail because of their addiction, when you ask that group of people what's your, what, who was 12 in the room, every hand is up at 12. But when you start counting backwards, 11, 10, 9, there are hands in the air at the age of 6. So that's somebody who's being given a drug by a parent or a family member. So addiction is a developmental pediatric disease. If you get to the age of 23 or 24 having never used a substance that's addictive, you will not develop an addiction. So you know what I say to my kids, my own patients that have strong genetic risk of addiction? I say the one thing you get to control is to delay your use. You are not the kid who can show up at an after homecoming party at the age of 16 or 17 and be drinking. Your genetic risk is too high. You need to delay it. I'm not telling you don't ever drink, it'll kill you, right? That's not a realistic message. I'm asking you, based on your genetic susceptibility, to postpone your use as long as possible. You need to be the kid that launches off to college and thinks, I'm going to go to the frat party, but I'm going to stand there with my red Solo cup and some ginger ale, and I'm going to look around the room and ask myself, who's going to get in trouble tonight? What girl do I need to protect from getting hauled up those back stairs? What guy do I need to say, you know what, guy? You are so drunk right now, you're going to come with me, and we're going to go hang out in the corner together because I'm worried that you're going to get yourself in trouble tonight, right? Those are the kids who need to be given the message of delaying use more than anybody else, right? And you know what happens? If they delay your use past the age of 22, 23, 24, the genetics almost entirely disappear. That's amazing that we get, our kids get to make that choice. So if at the age of 15, your kid starts drinking two alcoholic beverages a week, so you know that's two more beverages than I want my 15-year-old drinking, but having said that, I'm just talking two alcoholic beverages a week. 40% of those 15-year-olds go on to be alcoholics. If they can postpone till age 21 to expose their brain to alcohol, 7% go on to be alcoholics. So that's well less than the national averages. Okay, so let's, we're going to dive in on something that um, you guys are going to be sick of me by the end of this, but we're going to dive in right now, okay? Cigarette use has never been lower in the history of the United States, except prior to the year 1900. I'm going to talk about that. But our kids, in general, do not smoke cigarettes. Very few. If you ask the average 14-year-old, do you smoke? They're like, cigarettes? No, of course I don't. That's disgusting. It's going to kill you, right? Or, you know, what do you guys think about smoking cigarettes? Yeah, I just got vomiting motion happening here, right? And that's actually a very normal reaction. Most teenagers, most adolescents, most elementary school kids think smoking cigarettes is absolutely disgusting, and they're never going to do it. I hear that all day long. The problem is the sense of harm or risk to marijuana has gone away. And there's this very strong sense, if you ask anybody under the age of 24 what they think about marijuana, what do they tell you? It's no big deal, it's no problem. What else? It's legal. That one, of everything we're about to say, that one is true. What else? So another response is a, a responsible young person saying, just because it's legal does not necessarily mean it's safe. Other things that you might hear about marijuana from a teenager. Annie? It's natural, it's organic, I grow it in the ground, it's better than the pharmaceutical industry. Yep. It's like a plant, it's like an herbal product, it's like a supplement, it makes me feel good, it treats my anxiety, it helps me sleep at night, all of those things. It's not addictive, right? We're gonna, I don't, you can't necessarily hear it in my voice, but I'm gonna dismantle almost all of that stuff, okay? Uh, it's better than alcohol, that's a very common fast response. It treats diseases, right? It's used medically to help diseases. So you guys did the list, that's the common list, yeah. You can smoke as much as you want and you don't get drunk. Like, 
Right, right. You can't overdose and, and die. Yeah, we hear that one too. Okay. So there are three things that happen, critical things that happen between the ages of 12 and 24. It's happening in this school, it is happening in the high school, these massively critical things. And our teenagers need to know what's happening. So in their brains, the first thing that's happening is they are pruning back synaptic connections in the brain. Teenage 12-year-old brains have tens of billions of connections, and that's not good. That's too many connections. You never think there's too much of stuff in your brain. There is too much. Part of that 12-year span of time is they are clipping back unnecessary connections to make a more efficient, better functioning brain. And if this does not happen when they're adolescents, you end up with a profoundly unhealthy brain, something that looks more like a really major um, psychiatric illness like schizophrenia. This is, not a, this is a process that must happen at this stage. The second thing that happens is called myelination, when you ensheath these rapid pathways, efficient pathways in the brain. So these are two steps that must happen during adolescence, and it is the reason why our adolescents, and I have three teenagers at home, um, have these brains that sometimes, as a parent and a doctor and an adult, make me crazy. But this is normal. These are brains that are pushing the envelope all the time, because these brains are trying to sort out what does it need to keep and what does it need to get rid of. Their teenage brains, these adolescent brains, are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing when they are sensation-seeking, very physically oriented, um, they have less than optimal planning, less consideration for bad outcomes, more risky impulsive behavior. There's this very strong act first, think later. Emotions are felt incredibly intensely. Does anybody agree with me? Anybody parenting? Right? And these emotions, my 15 year old daughter, she loves me and tells me I'm pretty, and 10 seconds later, she's screaming at me in tears. And I'm thinking to myself, how could that have unfolded in 10 seconds? I haven't even spoken a word yet, and that has unfolded in 10 seconds. So there's never a time in your life when you're that emotionally labile. Again, this is nothing wrong with these brains. This is what these brains are supposed to look like, right? There's never a time in your life where you're more influenced by your peers, ever. When you were seven years old and a second grader on the schoolyard and one of your friends told you to do something really stupid, most seven-year-olds are like, no, I'm gonna go tell the teacher because that seems like a bad idea. And when you're 27 and your friends are like, let's go do something really stupid, you're like, dude, that's really stupid, I'm not gonna do it. But when you're 15, you're like, yeah, I'm in. Like, that sounds like a good idea. Because specifically during adolescence is this time when you're searching for your people, you're looking for your herd, you're never more influenced by your peers, and it's why your kids' friends matter. Okay, there's a third thing that happens to the brain during this developmental period. It lays down receptors in the final shell, the final cortex of the brain. The first receptor it lays down is dopamine. We talked about dopamine. We talked about the fact that dopamine gets disrupted with drug exposure. And here I have this critical receptor getting laid down. There's a second receptor that gets laid down. It's called anandamide. I'd never heard of it. I went to a medical school that was really focused on brain neurochemistry. I went back and looked at my notes. It wasn't in my notes. Because it had been discovered since I left medical school. It's not well known. The problem with anandamide is the receptor that helps determine what gets pruned back and what gets kept. And the real problem with anandamide is it is a naturally occurring neuroendocannabinoid. It is a mirror image of THC, which is the cannabinoid, the psychoactive, makes you high cannabinoid in marijuana. And the problem with this um, receptor is that THC, which is what is in marijuana, attaches itself to this receptor in the brain that's in charge of deciding what gets pruned back and it's much more aggressive. It's sort of a bully, and so it knocks your naturally occurring one out of the way, and it's like using a sledgehammer to decide what's gonna be kept in your brain instead of a scalpel. So I'm gonna be honest, I actually don't care what an adult over the age of 25 or 30 or whatever does with marijuana. I don't think it's any worse than alcohol is in the adult, fully developed brain. I don't think you should be driving. I don't think you should operate on my knee. You don't change the lug nuts on my tire. Like, what you do in your basement over the age of 25 with marijuana, I don't care. 
But what I really care about every single day is what happens to our kids under the age of 25 when exposed to marijuana. It is not a safe drug in the developing brain. And when it is legal and available and smoked routinely in a household, it enters into our kids' brains. And I will argue that most people in the room walked in here not knowing any of this. And that's what bothers me so much, is that we just let loose something that we know nothing about. So let's talk about what happens to teenage brains when exposed to marijuana. They have effects on attention, verbal learning, memory, processing speed. Even when they're not high, it stays with them. I like this slide even though it's complicated. And if you don't mind, just stick with it because I need you to understand this stuff. When we ask teenagers, so when you ask the average um, state average on marijuana use at high school senior levels, about 34% of high school seniors have used marijuana in the last month. There are some communities where that number is closer to 55%, so that's extremely high use. And most kids who are using marijuana will use it actually every day. Some kids will use it multiple times a day. So this is an evaluation that looks at what happened between the ages of 15 and 21 for people, and I'm going to compare the two extremes so it's easier to see, but that top blue bar on both those graphs represents people who used marijuana zero times between the ages of 15 and 21, and I'm going to compare it to the dark blue bottom bar for people who used marijuana greater than 400 times. Now, in six years' time, 400 times, it doesn't take much to get there. That's my point, okay? So when you look at graduation from college by the age of 25, if you used marijuana zero times, you graduated from college about 36% of the time. For those who used marijuana 400 times or more, their graduation rate was about 17%. And then you ask the question, well, who cares about college? I'm not going to think about that. Do they have a job? Okay. So when you look at unemployment rates for people who used marijuana zero time, the unemployment rate by age 25 was about 18%. And when you look at kids who used marijuana more than 400 times, the unemployment rate was 43%. So that, for me, is a failure to launch. That is a generation of kids who are living in my basement still, playing video games, and not out living their fully actualized lives. That's a problem. So for anybody who thinks marijuana is a benign drug, again, you can agree to that. But you, most of us have got to also agree that while the brain is developing, it is a harmful drug. Um, the other problem that I'm going to say is that every study we have is based on the old marijuana, and that is based on marijuana that was 2.5% THC or less. So the psychoactive component of marijuana, which is THC, everything that was used in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s was THC less than 2.5%. There is not a single field-grown marijuana plant that the DEA has confiscated that is sitting anywhere less than 9 to 16 percent THC, and every year the THC gets, more, it gets stronger. The other problem is that this is what marijuana now looks like. Most of you, if you found that in your kid's bedroom, would be like, that's disgusting, and you'd pick it up with a Kleenex. These are marijuana concentrates, earwax, shatter, butter, um, hash oil. The THC concentrations in these are between 40 and 90 percent. This is 40 percent of the Colorado retail market are the concentrates. And we just passed a bill in this state in November that has no limit on THC levels. All of this stuff will be available in East Longmeadow as soon as the store opens. The more worrisome thing to me, or as worrisome, um, is all the ways that you can consume this stuff, right? If I gave the average 17-year-old a fat rolled joint, most of them wouldn't even recognize it because the way that they're um, using marijuana is much more intense. Uh, the, the hits are stronger, partly because the THC is higher, but because you're able to heat the, the, um, the marijuana in a vape element that really concentrates it straight into your lungs, into your brain. So you can rub it on your skin as a, as, a, a, as a lotion. It goes underneath your tongue as an oil. You can cook with it. It's in spaghetti sauce and milk and beer. It's in everything imaginable. And most importantly, it is actually designed to sell to kids, right? 60% of the Colorado market is candy, is candy edibles. So packed with sugar, every one of those candy bars has 12 servings of marijuana in it. Each of those bars also range between 40 and 90% THC. 
So the last time you shared a Kit Kat with 11 other people was never in your entire life. <laughs> Yet this too will be coming to your local marijuana store because we just passed something that said no limits on anything. And in fact, it specifically spells out they have to sell edibles. This is targeted to kids. Nobody can convince me any other way. This is intended to addict as much of this next generation as possible. And I'm not trying to be a cynic, but this is an industry that's bent on making tens of millions, tens of billions of dollars, and it's based on hooking this generation. So not a good thing. I'm not happy about what's happened. Um, and it's all tobacco, right? I mean, like, think, I mean, most people in this room, some of us still smoke, but most of us have gotten off cigarettes. In general, nationwide, fewer and fewer of us are, are smoking. And back in the old days, 1900, nobody smoked in this country. Less than 1% of Americans in the year 1900 smoked tobacco. Yet tobacco was a native plant of North America, right? It's grown here, the, the native people of our country used it ritually. They didn't smoke the equivalent of two packs a day. But in the year 1900, the industry took over. And the first thing the tobacco industry did is they grew a more potent tobacco. They grew a bigger leaf with thicker veins. That's what holds the nicotine. That's the first change. Whoops, we just said that's what marijuana's done. And then the tobacco industry began to take the tobacco, roll it into little tiny sticks covered in paper, and add a bunch of other flavorings and chemicals to get you as hooked as possible, which is, again, is what the marijuana industry is doing. So in the year 1900, fewer than one, less than 1% 1 of Americans used tobacco. By the year 1950, nearly 70% of American men smoked tobacco. That was brought to you by the American tobacco industry, and that is what is happening now. So anybody who thinks this is a nice natural thing growing in your backyard on your patio planter, that's not what this is. This is an industry that looks like that top picture there. That is what is slated for southeastern Massachusetts. That's a grow plant. For marijuana, they're incredibly unenvironmental. Huge amounts of water, huge amounts of electricity. Um, four plants of marijuana is the equivalent of 29 refrigerators all running at a time. It's not good for the environment. Okay, I told you you were gonna get tired of me, but I had to dive in on marijuana because it's our number one drug right now, and I can't walk away from this room without you guys walking out of here incredibly knowledgeable about it. So now we're gonna move away. Let's talk about alcohol. I actually think alcohol is the number one drug of abuse in our country, other than nicotine. Um, and actually, alcohol has a huge impact on families, on communities, on people's lives. When you look at our House of Corrections, people think that people get locked up for heroin. First of all, people don't get locked up for marijuana, not in this state. Since 2010, I think, we haven't incarcerated people for, for possession of marijuana. But actually, a lot of our jails are filled with people who have an alcohol use problem. One third of us in this country drink nothing, zero, okay? The next one third of us drink a little bit, a drink a, a month, a couple drinks a month, a drink a week. Very, very, very light social drinking. And the final one third of us drink all of the rest of the alcohol. And in fact, the final 10% of us drink on average 10 drinks a day. So that seems like a huge number, right? Like an unimaginable number. And I would argue that most of the people who are drinking 10 drinks a day aren't here right now. Because to drink 10 drinks a day, you probably had to already start. Um, and how do you get there? Because drinks add up fast. A beer is a beer. 12 ounce beer can is equal to one drink. Hard alcohol, it's one and a half ounces. So for those of you who drink a mixed drink, very few of us carefully measure anything, right? We're like glug, 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 and glug, 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 right? That's how most people make their gin and tonics. So most mixed drinks usually have a couple, couple, um, uh, drinks within it. The real problem these days is wine. Um, and if you ask women in particular, how much do you drink, they will say, oh, you know, I have a couple glasses at night. And then I say, what's in a glass? And they say, you know, a glass, right? And they show me something with their hand, which is not your grandmother's 1960s wedding glasses, right? It's a giant goblet, right? Mason jar on a stem kind of glass of wine. And women drink a lot of wine these days because we're stressed out, we're overwhelmed, we've been up since five, we're gonna be up till midnight, we worked all day, and we come home and we still work all day. It never ends. So there's this consumption of alcohol that's the transition to my home life. It makes me feel better, it helps me sleep. It doesn't do any of those things for real. Um, it actually is causing more and more significant damage because women are much more vulnerable to alcohol. 
The other thing I'm going to say to the adults in this room, when you come home from work after a hard day at work and the first thing your kid sees you do is pop the top off a beer bottle or pour yourself a really big glass of wine, the message you send to your kids is when you're overwhelmed, when you're stressed out, if you drink, you get better. That's not the message you want your kids to see. You want to walk in the door after a hard day at work and say, man, I had a terrible day at work. Anybody want to go on a walk with me? I hate my job. I think I'd like to quit my job. I think I need to go turn on my smartphone with my John Kabat-Zinn mindfulness meditation app. I need to go sit down in the living room for 15 minutes and calm my brain down. I found myself leaving work thinking, I've had a terrible day. I need a drink. The moment I started thinking the words, I need a drink, I don't get to drink, right? Because I'm clearly using it to change who I am and change my experience of the world. And so ask yourself as an adult, the last time you were at an adult party where there was not alcohol, and see what you can do to change that. It's not a good message to send to your kids. Okay, third thing that predisposes you to um, addiction. I'm going to race through this just because of my audience, but adverse childhood experiences or trauma. A study came out in the year of 2007 that looked at what happens to people under the age of 18 in their house. Um, and I think a lot of us can acknowledge that lots of bad things happen to a lot of us growing up. And I'm not going to go through the details of the survey. If you ever Google ACE survey or ACE study, all of it will pop up. I'm actually going to, Anne has my slides, and I would love everybody in this room to have my slides. And I don't know the right way to do it, except maybe have a sheet of paper on one of those tables where if you put down your email, Anne will email it to you. Is that fair, Anne? Okay, so over there will be a sign-up sheet. Anybody who wants my slides can take them. You can go give this talk anywhere you want. You can say you made the talk. I don't care what you do. You don't need to credit me. Spread the word. But you can go back and study these slides. I actually don't show you every slide, so there's other slides embedded in it. But what this study does is it measures what happens in households that have high abuse, high neglect, and high household dysfunction. And when you have households with those high things, you have people who are very susceptible to every chronic disease out there, in fact. If you score a six or a higher on what we call the ACE study, you're going to die 20 years earlier, right? It predicts for every chronic disease out there. Specifically, though, it predicts for who's going to struggle with addiction and who's going to struggle with chronic pain. So this is not a survey that's given to kids. It's not used in our school system. But I'm going to say to you that teachers and school nurses and school adjustment counselors and school resource officers, they actually know your kids' ACE scores. They're adding them up in their heads because they know what happens at home, right? Having some hard things happen in your family's lives. And some of those things are things like divorce. Divorce is really hard on our kids. Lots, I'm the child of divorce. I, I score a one on an ACE score. My parents were divorced. Otherwise, I had a really blessed childhood. Um, but having high trauma puts you at high risk of addiction. So three things are going to predispose you to addiction. Genetics, a history of childhood trauma, and the third is early exposure while your brain is developing. And so my message to you guys in the room under the age of 24 is to delay your use as long as possible. That's the message. I'm not going to say don't ever, ever drink. Don't ever use marijuana. You're going to die. I'm not saying that. Just delay the use as long as possible. And if you have high family history, you really need to delay really a long time, 21, 22. That would be a great thing. It would be very protective. I'm never going to tell you I want you to smoke cigarettes or use heroin, right? Those are really dangerous drugs. But um, delay use as long as you can. So our kids, having said that, are actually making the best decisions about substances that we have seen in 40 years. They are making way better decisions than every other adult in this room made. They are using very little alcohol in general. They um, are using uh, cigarettes almost at vanishingly small rates. In the 1980s, which is when I went to high school, we were terrible. Drinking a lot, smoking a lot, very bad behavior. So our kids are getting the message and they're making great decisions. What is flat is the illicit use, mainly because of marijuana. So I want to give a shout out to our kids, 70% of whom do nothing, right? And we don't spend any time talking about the fact that most, the vast majority of our kids are making great decisions, and they need to be celebrated more. And we need to sort of downplay the really loud, obnoxious kids who just got suspended and kicked off the track team because they were smoking weed on, on, on the school property. I wish they got almost no attention because they're not the norm, yet they always seem to define the norm. When my ninth grader comes home and says, everybody in my class smokes pot, I'm like, Ella, really, really? Tell me, count it up in your head. How many kids do you know smoke marijuana? And she's like, four. And I'm like, right, four, 
right? That's not everyone in your class. That's four kids and they happen to be obnoxious, right? So acknowledge that most of the kids in your class are making good choices. Okay, again, low, low, low on everything. So I do want to talk about what happened in the last five or six years with opiates. So every morning, I live just north of you guys on I-91, and every morning I get up and I walk the dog and I make the coffee and I read the obituaries in my local paper because I'm a family doctor and because I take care of people who die. And I need to call the families, I need to fill out a death certificate. I'm sort of obsessed with my obituaries. And so in December of 2012, I woke up and read the obituaries and the obituary read about that young woman in the top left picture. Ashley Sims, age 21, died of a heroin overdose at home. And I thought, oh my God, I know her. I know her grandmothers who raised her. And I called them to express how sorry I was about her death and shocked and to thank them for telling the truth about how Ashley had died. Because for several years I'd been reading obituaries of young people, relatively young, under the age of 50, dying unexpectedly at home. And people dying unexpectedly at home, right, or tend to be either suicides or overdoses. If the end of the obituary reads, give to Dana-Farber or the Cancer Center at Bay State or the Lymphoma Leukemia Society, it's an expected death from cancer. You, most of us knew that one. But otherwise, unanticipated young deaths are often an overdose or a suicide, and these days more likely to be an overdose. Those two grandmothers went to our local paper and said, you have got to tell the story about what is happening in our community because people are dying and we don't know about it. And so our little Greenfield recorder began running front page stories every day about what the opiate epidemic was doing to our schools and to our jails and to the court system and to doctor's offices and what, what human lives um, how much people were suffering. And it became sort of stories that everybody in our community read and followed, and the news really began to spread. And this little county north of you guys, which is actually the most rural, and um, it's Hamden County is actually a little more poor than we are, but Hamden and Franklin County are the two poorest counties in the state. We really, in Western Mass, have led the way around the state in terms of managing the addiction problem. And Massachusetts and Vermont are the two leaders in the entire country when it comes to addiction. Sometimes I don't feel that way. Sometimes I'm like, oh my God, we're not far ahead enough, but we're way ahead of everybody else. That's sad. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that pills are on the hook for this, that the overprescription of pills for the last 15 to 18 to 20 years definitely started this problem. It's not why people are dying now. People die of heroin and fentanyl. That's what kills people in general. It's infrequent that you'll find somebody who's actually dying of straight pill use. I'm not saying pills are good, certainly not the abusive pills, because it, it launches people down that path. Uh, we all know the more you prescribe pills, the more people will get addicted, the more people will die. I like this slide and I want to pause for a minute because this is a real public health slide. Okay, So this says, how did people in the United States die between the years 2000 and 2010? In the bottom bars that go off in the negative direction are places where we reduced death in a decade. And the, and the positive bars going off to the right are places where there's an increase in death. So there was a 34% reduction in death by aneurysm, ruptured aortic aneurysm, which is this giant vessel in your belly. And when it, when it opens up and blows, you have like three hours to live. Why did we reduce aortic aneurysm death? Let me know. We, we reduced cigarette smoking. When you stop smoking, your aneurysms don't rupture. So we reduce smoking, public health intervention. There's a 23% reduction in influenza and pneumonia. Why is that? vaccines, we give people shots. There's a 23% reduction in death by motor vehicle accidents. Why is that? Seatbelts. Public health measures matter, right? This isn't me in my office. This is the public health system saying everybody's got to wear a seatbelt. So then you look at the top numbers, how people are dying, and what you see is there appears to be an epidemic of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and end-stage kidney failure. Do we really have an epidemic of those things? What is that about? You're going to live forever, right? You are going to live an unbelievably long time. And eventually, when you're 97 and I'm filling out your death certificate, I'm like, uh, I don't know, Alzheimer's? I mean, I, you haven't recognized me in 10 years. What really took you? You don't get to write old age on a death certificate. So we don't truly have an epidemic of those things. It's just that you're going to live forever, and those are the things that will eventually take you out, except for that top bar, which shows that there's a 276% increase in death by, death by opiate overdose. And the problem is that this uh, data 
happened before heroin in a big way even hit us. And at this point, that bar graph goes right off the screen, right out the wall. It probably goes out to the courtyard because there's somewhere between 90 and 140 people dying every single day in this country from a death from opiates. That's where we are today. We've well surpassed the peak of the uh, HIV epidemic in terms of death due to opiate overdose. So when you look at the country, those red areas are where death is happening from drug overdose. That top map is 2003, and then it marches along. And you just watch the country turn red. Most of the pills that came to New England came out of Maine. We used to call I-95 Oxy Highway. I'm sorry, did I say the word Maine? That was terrible of me. From Florida, they went to Maine, from Florida. Um, Oxy Highway is what we would call it. Because there were 600 pill mills in the state of Florida and people would send tour buses down to Florida. And you would get on a bus, you had free nights in a hotel, a free ride on a bus, you probably got your meals paid for. And you had to go to a couple pain clinics every day and you didn't need a cane, you didn't need to be old, you didn't even die, need a diagnosis, you just needed money. And you walked in, you paid your money, and you got a bag full of pills and a couple of prescriptions, which then you handed off to your tour operator who brought back all those pills and prescriptions to Kentucky and Ohio and Massachusetts and Maine and sold those pills on the street. So in the year, in 2009, the federal government took a look at the state of Florida and said, you guys have got to pull your act together because you're destroying the eastern seaboard. And until you close down these pill mills, we're going to cut off federal funding. No education funds, no highway funds. And they actually meant real business. It wasn't an empty threat. So about 600 pain clinics in Florida were shut down in a very fast sting operation. 34 doctors were incarcerated because they weren't doctors, they were drug dealers. They were making between five and ten million dollars a year, cash business hooking people on a terrible addictive drug. The problem is that when you shut down all the pills and you have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people addicted to opiates all up and down I-95, what are you left with? Right? You're left with heroin. That's what you're left with. You close off the pipeline, you end up getting substituted with an even more deadly addictive drug. So the Mexican cartels were watching everything we were doing. They had mowed over their marijuana fields like in 2006 and 2007, and they had started to plant opium poppies. Their distribution, a very wide distribution that's very rural and focused, started in about 2005 and 2006 of heroin all throughout the country. This is a great uh, Washington Post article that just came out talking about how how smart and how fast the drug gets to this country and how building a wall isn't going to change the drugs coming to this country, right? This is a small airport, Uber drivers, not that Uber drivers are, are, are bringing in the drugs, but the stuff gets dr driven all over the country with Uber or Lyft and Dayton, Ohio airports um, carried in by human beings. So when you ask EMS what the number one drug of abuse is that concerns them, those dark green areas, the answer is heroin or opiates. But what's amazing to me is that more of the country doesn't light up. Like, what's up with the southeast in Florida? Why don't they light up with a heroin problem? Somebody said meth? You know, meth, thank God, is on the down low right now, right? Part of it is because Mexico isn't making as much because they're making too much heroin and because it's hard to get the ingredients now in this country. So the answer is not meth. The answer is what somebody, I think, said. Those dark purple states have, on average, between one and one and a half bottles of opiates per person in that state. Those are heavily prescribed states still. Those are states where you can walk into your doctor's office with a migraine and get 90 of something, right? Something that's really addictive. Heavily prescribed opiates are still happening in those dark purple states. But when the DEA and the CDC and other uh, medical entities start to really crack down on how you can prescribe, those dark purple states are going to look a lot more like those red states. Those red states are the number one problem is heroin. That is us, right? But if you can imagine every one of those dark purple states becoming a red state where the number one drug of abuse is heroin, what I predict is there's going to be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of death by opiate overdose in the southeast in the next five years. Because those are not states that are building methadone clinics and training doctors on how to help people with addiction or having every EMS person and every police car have Narcan. 
Our school nurses have Narcan in their schools. Somebody overdoses in most schools in Massachusetts, there's a school nurse who will respond with the appropriate measure. We're one of the only states in the country that would do that. You think the Southeast is gonna have Narcan available? It's not happening. So how, what happens to our kids? So I want to be clear, most kids are not abusing opiates. It's less than two and a half percent of our kids have ever used an opiate prescription. And you know why that is? Because adults are taking responsibility. So first of all, just pause for a minute and ask yourself the question, do I have a controlled substance in my house? Do I have an old bottle of Percocet or Vicodin? Do I have an unused bottle of Valium or Ativan or anything? Do I have any of those in my house? And if your answer, internally, you don't need to shout it out, but if your answer is yes, you need to take a breath and you need to think to yourself, what am I doing tomorrow that involves dropping that drug off at a police take back box? Because it no longer belongs in your house. If you are actively using a prescription for a controlled substance, it needs to be under lock and key. But that's a message that we've been giving for years now. Like that's a 2010 message as far as I'm concerned. We're done with that message. Our kids should not be accessing prescription drugs from your medicine cabinet. And my hope is that everybody in this room answered that question, yeah, I don't have those drugs in my house. If you do, you need to get rid of them, as far as I'm concerned. My alcohol is under lock and key at my house. I have three teenagers. Why would I make it any easier for them to drink than it needs to be? And I'm not a crazy parent. I'm actually a pretty relaxed parent. So our kids get exposed to opiates from prescription. So what might happen to your kid while their brain is developing where they would get an opiate prescription, they get injured. They fracture a femur, they're a female soccer player, they get an ACL tear, it gets repaired, they get their wisdom teeth out, right? They get some dental horrible thing, right? Which is what my kids have had. So who has had a kid who's had, a, had wisdom teeth out in the room? Okay, and were you given a prescription for an opiate? And how many, may I ask you? Can't really remember. Anybody else have a number that they remember being prescribed? 20, okay, anybody else? Did any, yeah? I'm sorry, was the number six zero? What year was that? A while ago, I hope. Please tell me that was a while ago. Six, seven years ago, okay. Okay, <laughs> so, let, so I have now asked this question for four years, right? And I will say that the answer of 60 used to be not abnormal. It was pretty normal. And then it got to be 30. And now I routinely, I don't even get 20s anymore. I routinely get a 15 or a 12. If your kid has had a dental procedure this year, I would say I would be surprised if that person wrote for more than 15. And I would be alarmed if they did. But when I ask the question, how many did your kid use? The answer is always, they use zero, two, four, or six. I have never once heard of anybody using more than six. One time I had a guy from the back shout out, I use 60, and I thought, well, there's an oral surgeon I'm never gonna go see, right? And I looked at him, I said, you did? And he said, but I'm an addict. And I thought, got it. So in general, if your kid's having an oral procedure, who gets to control the meds? You're the adult in the family, right? So when my kid had big oral surgery, the dentist knew exactly who I was, and his hand is hovering over that prescription pad, and I was like, don't even bother. Like, I'm not going to fill it. I'm not going to give it to my kid. I will use a combination of Tylenol and Motrin and distraction, which works nearly all the time. You will never leave your kid home alone to control their own opiate prescription, right? You've got to manage it yourself. And you're going to use as little as you can because you just don't need that in a developing brain. Why? What's the benefit? And lots of us are get sick by them. They don't make us feel good. Okay, so these are signs at home that your kid is in trouble. And I always say to people, I believe that any one of my kids could develop an addiction. I, I, I believe that because I, I know my family. Um, but I like to be the mom who figures it out about three months in. That's my personal bar. I'd like to not be the mom who figured it out three years in. I know that seems pathetic, but helping somebody who's been at it hard for three months is really different than somebody who's been at it for three years. So I look in my kids' bedrooms. I don't clean their rooms. I do not do their laundry. I walk in their rooms. I do a lot of yelling because I'm ticked off at what I find in terms of messiness, but um, I look for worrisome signs. So. Burnt foil, you should never find burnt foil in your kid's room. A bent spoon with burn marks. I mean, those, are, those aren't just red flags. Those are screaming sirens going off in your head. If your kid is a type one diabetic, first of all, most of them are not using their own insulin needles on their own in their own rooms. But if you ever found anything that looked like needles or caps of needles, that's a major red flag. 
But um, things that are worrisome that you may not know are worrisome. First of all, finding pills in your kid's room. Your kids should not have bottles of pills in their rooms. They shouldn't have Advil or Benadryl in their room. Most of our kids don't know how to dose it. That should be really, uh, I say to my kids, you have a headache? You have trouble? You talk to me. Not because I'm a doctor, but because I'm a parent. You tell me, and I will tell you what I think you should take and at what dose, right? Because they can't tell the difference between Tylenol and Advil, and they can't do the math on what's a safe dose in a 15-year-old. Um, so other things that you might find besides being worried about pills, but anything you could snort through, straws or rolled up dollar bills, these are things that you would look for and be concerned. And I look in my kids' rooms every week or two for worrisome things, and I'm not a crazy parent, I promise. So if you have somebody you love that you're worried about, you should have naloxone. I carry it in my purse. I think mine's expired. I realize that. I think I need to go get a new one. But if you have somebody you love who has an opiate use disorder, you should have Narcan available. Again, our school nurses have Narcan. These guys over here use Narcan. Lots of people have it. But if you have somebody who lives with you, you need to get it. It is available without a prescription at every CVS and Walgreens in the state of Massachusetts. I didn't used to be able to say that, but now it's basically true. And it's covered by your insurance. Insurance. You just have to ask for it. This is a website called Get Naloxo Now. It'll explain everything you need to know. These are great books on addiction that I've read in the last couple of years. If you, if you found this talk interesting, you think, you know what, I need to learn more. It's part of my job. I need more on this subject. Then take a picture with your smartphone or get the slides from Ann. All of these books are great. The best book on trauma I've ever read is that top book called The Body Keeps the Score. For people in the medical world or in nursing school or doing other things, understanding what happens to the body that has been exposed to trauma will really make you much better as a clinician. Um, there's a YouTube video, uh, if you YouTube my name, which is Ruth Poti, there's a video of me that comes up that's a lot like this talk. I change my talk all the time. I'm always updating it and adding new stuff, but that talk is maybe a year or a year old. And so you could share that talk with anybody you think might benefit, or if you think your kid needed to hear this and they weren't here tonight, give it to them. And there's nothing inappropriate in it. Did this go over anybody's head in the room? Did you guys do okay? How about my 11-year-olds? You got most of it, right? You got most of it? I'm going to quiz you guys later. Okay. No, no, I'm, I'm teasing you. I'm not going to. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need school. I'm totally not quizzing you. I love that you're here and you answered questions. Okay, what questions do people have? Yes, so I'm going to repeat the question. Would that be good enough? Let's hand the mic because I want you guys on the, on the picture. So who has a question? You guys can't be my first audience without any questions. That's never happened. Oh, in the back. So will you take the mic, though, so he can capture you? Come up. Come up. Or I, I'll repeat your question. You want me to repeat it? OK, lovely. Studying to be a mental health clinician at Bay Path University. Yeah, I'm graduating next May. Um, so my question is, what is your opinion on needle exchange programs? So her question is, what is my opinion on needle exchange program? So what a needle exchange program is, is a place that's funded by um, state and federal money, not federal money, state money, that says, wow, you're struggling with a, an addiction problem, and um, the harm that comes from struggling with an addiction and using drugs through your veins, IV, is so great. Your high likelihood to develop HIV disease, hepatitis C, skin infections, spine infections, heart, heart infections. You're so high risk for developing those diseases that we think it's safer for us to provide you equipment that's clean and safe to prevent the cost and terrible outcomes of those. And by the way, while you're with us getting your clean needles, we're, gonna, we're not going to coerce you. We're not going to strong arm you. We're not going to manipulate you. But we're going to be here as a resource for you for the day that you decide you want to get better. We're the place that's going to make that happen. I am a huge advocate for needle exchanges. I feel fiercely about them. I both helped fund and fight for the one in Holyoke. I feel very strongly. I actually, you know, I feel strongly about having safe places for people to inject, quite honestly. People are dying at a rapid rate right now. In the last three months with the fentanyl that we have, people are dropping instantly, right? They, they are, they, the needle is still in their arm and they are already dead. So the drug has gotten so out of control, so strong, so darn unpredictable. If they're gonna inject, I'd like to have them do it right in front of me so that if they're about to die, I can reverse it. So there's the option of actually having the first safe injection site in Boston um, happening right now, which is extraordinary. Canada's been doing it for a while. Are we? creating disease? Are we, are we allowing people to continue their disease? They're going to do it anyway. 
but right, let's engage with them and try to prevent, because I could tell you the cost of this epidemic is not just about the death and about what it does to schools and communities and to the cost to EMS and to firefighters. The actual disease burden of this, of this disease is huge. When you get your first infection of a heart valve, something called endocarditis, that's about a quarter million dollars of treatment because you need six weeks of antibiotics often in a hospital setting. It costs a lot of money. You often need open heart surgery to replace the valve. There are people who've had three open heart surgeries. These are diseases that are adding up fast. And I'm somebody who's a cheapskate. I like to not spend money on healthcare. And so doing prevention saves money. So thank you for asking that very smart question. Yes. Hi, I'm, we're from Stick. That was really loud. Mm -hmm. We're from Stick. We're nursing students. And my question for you is, so you know D.A.R.E. went away a couple years, probably more than a couple years ago. When do you think that D.A.R.E., yeah, when do you think drug education should start for kids? What age? So she was saying that D.A.R.E. is no longer used as a curriculum in many schools, and there's a reason for that. Um, I hope I'm not gonna offend anybody here, but um, so D.A.R.E. is a curriculum that was often brought by public safety or police, and for some people it was helpful, but when they did the studies, because we've had D.A.R.E. now for 20 something years, it actually did not show to reduce use, it actually in weird ways showed an increase in use. It was not a positive um, curriculum. So as a curriculum, we've now veered a little bit away from D.A.R.E., and we're more about prevention curriculum. The truth is it starts at the age of fifth grade. My 11-year-olds here, this is the age. 9, 10, 11, that's the first time they should start to hear it. They didn't get all of it, they didn't need to get all of it, but starting to talk to a fifth grader is when the conversation needs to happen. And it's not saying, look, let's talk about the hard drugs and how do you inject and endocarditis. You're talking about the fact that while your brain is developing, you need to help protect it. You need to protect it by doing really healthy things. What was the answer that came from this row? They said doing good for other people. Those are behaviors that help protect your friends. So most schools have good curriculums. I don't know what the curriculum is here for prevention. You guys start, and what's your curriculum you use? Do you remember, do you guys have a set curriculum? through health education. There's a lot of um, sort of well-studied set curriculums that have a lot of universal evidence behind them um, throughout the country. You have to pay a little money for many of those set curriculums, but they tend to be good. And it starts here in this school district in sixth grade. That's pretty good. There's a lot of schools that have nothing, nothing coming their way. That's pretty appalling. Talk about not doing prevention. So that's a great question about DARE. Other questions? Annie. You can shout, I know you. Yep. How come do I not talk more about marijuana being a hallucinogen? So, because um, it isn't a hallucinogen for everybody, and there are hallucinogens out there. So these are sort of the psychedelic um, drugs that really make your brain um, see and think strange, odd things. I don't talk about every drug when I'm up here. One, because it's getting late, and uh, I could do a four-hour talk if you wanted me to. There's a lot of drugs out there, right? There's a lot of things I absolutely didn't cover. I didn't talk about bath salts or PCP or a bunch of other things. For some people, particularly with these high-potency THCs, their brains become really profoundly unwell. There's a much higher rate that we see of psychosis, right, of people actually becoming psychotic due to marijuana, extreme severe anxiety. So this is for my nursing students. You're working in the emergency room, and some young person comes in with a major panic attack, completely freaking out. One of your first questions you're asking is, what did you smoke? What did you vape? What marijuana did you use? And, and um, have you done that before? Because it is a very common cause of psychosis and mental illness. Because the potencies are so high. And because when you're buying your candy bar with 12 servings, and you ate the entire thing because you just ate a Kit Kat, um, you just had no idea how much you just got. So the ERs in Colorado are chock full of people who are psychotic. It goes away, but it doesn't always go away. There's a higher. Um, a higher likelihood of developing schizophrenia due to early exposure to marijuana. Again, not a healthy, healthy drug while the brain is developing. Well, listen, you've been a great audience. I'm happy to take questions afterwards up here. And again, if you want the slides, maybe, maybe see Annie or any, oh no, right over there, we've got a piece of paper. Sign up with an email and somebody will email you the slides. Thanks everyone, thanks for being here.